In this video, we're going to talk about another measure of how a vector field can change called the divergence. So if I look at this uh, vector field here, it really looks like an explosion. It looks like everything is coming out from the origin. And the rate at which a vector field flows across a closed curve in 2D or across a surface in 3D is measured by the divergence of that vector field. So what we want to think about is imagine this very small sphere in 3D or in 2D, a small circle centered at a, a point. If the flow out from that circle is greater than the flow in, then uh, the divergence is positive at that point. And with this particular vector field, it's pretty clear that at the origin, uh, the divergence is positive because everything is flowing out from the origin. And, but in fact, if I put my circle anywhere in this vector field, I'll see that as I get further away from the origin, that uh, the vectors get longer and so the amount of uh, flow out of the circle is always going to be greater than the amount of flow into the circle. On the other hand, if you have more flowing out than you have flowing in, the divergence would be negative. So in this vector field, at the origin, again, everything is flowing out. So the divergence would be positive. But at the point B, it's negative because if you can see, the vectors are actually getting smaller as you go away from the origin. And so uh, the, there is um, more, vec more flowing in than there is flowing out. All right, so to motivate the formula, which is a very simple formula, for the divergence, we want to look at a different line integral. So we say that you know, the divergence measures how much stuff is flowing out or how much of a vector field F is flowing out of a closed curve. Well, let's try to calculate that. So we already found how much is flowing around the closed curve C. That was our circulation or the work done. It's our line integral that we looked at. But what we'd like to do is go through the same type of analysis that we used to derive the line integral. But now we're interested in how much is flowing out, not along, not in the direction of C, but flowing out of the curve C. So we're going to repeat most of the same steps that we did before. We'll start with a parameterization of the curve. And that, so that parameterization is valid between A and B. So we'll partition that A and B into n equal parts, subintervals that have the same length, delta t. And we'll let t sub i equal a plus i times delta t. And then um, we'll go ahead and let the point p sub i be the head of the position vector r of t sub i. And delta s sub i is going to be the length of the arc between p i minus 1 and p i. And then we'll choose a sample value between t sub i minus 1 and t sub i. We'll call that t sub i star. And so we're going to estimate the amount of f flowing across this small uh, curve from p i minus 1 to p i as about delta s sub i, so the length of that little curve, times the component of the vector field at that sample point in the direction of the outward unit normal vector at that point. So we've got the curve broken up into multiple pieces. And we're looking at the ith 
little length right here. We've picked a point in between there. We've got our unit normal vector. Here is our vector field f right here. So we'd like the component of this f going out of the curve this time. And we're going to multiply that times the length. We'll say that that's representative of that length when the uh, delta si is really small. And so that would be an estimate just on that little part right there. So let's look at that a little bit more carefully. So we've got our little bit of curve. We've got our normal vector at that sample point. We've got the vector field crossing over the curve there. And so what's the component of f in the direction of n? Well, we had our formula from the beginning of the course, and we'll make use of that. We're going to say that n is the unit normal vector, so its length is n. So the component of f in the direction of n is just f dotted with n. And so to estimate the total outward flow, well, I just go around in each n one of those n curves, pick a point, and then calculate the component of f in the direction of the outward unit normal at that point. Multiply it times the length of that little bit of curve, and then add those all up. So that's a Riemann sum. So as we let n go to infinity, we're going to get this different line integral. And so we still have uh, our function f, but now we're, we're dotting it with n, and we're taking the line integral with respect to arc length. So again, uh, OK, we've got an expression here. It hasn't quite led us to the formula for divergence yet. Let's just look at this line integral a little bit more carefully. All right, so remember that the unit tangent vector is just the tangent vector, r prime of t, where we have r is our parameterization, over its length. And the components for a plane curve would just be x prime of t and y prime of t divided by the length. Well, for the unit normal vector pointing out from the curve, we can easily verify that its components should be y prime of t and then negative x prime of t. We can just take the dot product and between n and t and verify that it's 0, meaning that they are orthogonal to each other. We can also verify that n is pointing out from the curve uh, if t is going in the positive direction, meaning you're, as you go along c, the interior of the curve is on your left. And of course, we're going to divide uh, our components by the length of that vector. But if you look at the length of that vector, it has exactly the same length as the length of the tangent vector. It's still x prime squared. The negative sign doesn't matter after squaring it, uh, plus y prime squared. So I could just look at those components divided by the length of r prime. And that's important because our uh, ds, so the differential with respect to arc length, is just the length of r prime times dt. So our function dotted with the unit normal times ds, well, this r prime will divide out with the r prime in the definition of the unit normal. And so we could just have our vector field with components p and q dotted with a vector with components dy and negative dx. And now we're going to have our parameter t uh, as uh, our variable for integration. 
All right, so let's look at that a little bit more carefully. So now you know actually how to calculate this. If we are at an example, we could actually calculate it. And so uh, we would calculate it as p dy minus q dx. So that line integral over c. Now I could rewrite this p dy minus q dx uh, in a slightly different way. I could say, well, instead of having our dy comma negative dx as our components, let's go back to our dr, which is dx dy, which means that my first vector would have to be a vector field, a different vector field, whose components are negative q and then p. Let's call that vector field g, the vector field whose i component is negative q and whose j component is positive p. Now, that can be a little confusing here, so I'm going to call its i component p hat, its j component q hat, because that's what we're used to seeing, p's and q's in that order. But just keep in mind that p hat is negative q and q hat equals p. So if I use Green's theorem with this g vector field, then I would say that the line integral, so this is the usual line integral, the circulation of g about c would be the double integral over r of the partial of q hat with respect to x minus the partial of p hat with respect to y. But q hat is just p, and p hat is negative q, so that would be the double integral of r of the partial of p with respect to x. Now p is our original uh, component function in the i component of f, and q is the j component of our original function f, dA. But now we're adding them together. We're taking the partial of p with respect to x, the partial of q with respect to y, adding them together. And so our new line integral could be written as this double integral. So this is, you could say it's a variation on Green's theorem, but it's really called Stokes's theorem in the plane. We're going to talk a lot about Stokes's theorem over the next couple of weeks, but this is our first view of it. So Stokes's theorem in the plane says that you can evaluate this line integral, so find the amount of f flowing across c by evaluating the double integral of the partial of p with respect to x plus the partial of q with respect to y. And that motivates the formula for divergence, which is you just take the partial of p, so it's the first component with respect to the first variable, plus the second component with respect to the second variable, plus the third component with respect to the third variable, and then you add them up. And so we can look at this new line integral as being the double integral of the divergence of f over the region r. Note that the divergence of f is a scalar. That's different from the curl. The curl is a vector. Divergence is a scalar. Now, when we learned the formula for curl, we said, oh, well, curl, we can use the same memory aid we use for the cross product. We said it was that del vector cross um, the um, vector field. Uh, and um, here we have a scalar. So scalar should remind us of scalar product. So it's not a surprise that if we use that same del, del vector, then we can write the divergence of f as del dotted with f. 
well, what if I take the curl of a vector field and then take that curl, which is a new vector field, and take its divergence? So in other words, we're going to take the divergence of the curl of f, or in our vector notation, del dotted with del cross f. Well, let's just go ahead and, and use the formula here. Uh, I've written all the components of the curl out. And so we'll take the partial with respect to x of the first component, the partial with respect to y of the second component, and the partial with respect to z of the third component. Now, if we go through this one component at the time, I'm going to get second mixed partial derivatives. So I'll get the second partial derivative of r, first x, then y, set minus the second partial derivative with respect to q of x, then z. Let me go through the other two as well. Now, I did this color co uh, coordination here to see that, oh, let's look at the mixed partials with respect to r. I've got one positive and one negative. The mixed partials of q, um, one positive, one negative. And the mixed partials with respect to p, one positive, one negative. Right? The only thing that's different is that we have the order. Here we have y, then z. Here we have uh, I'm sorry, z then y, and then here we have y then z. We just changed the order. But we know that from Clairaut's theorem that if they are, if p, q, and r have a continuous second order partial derivatives, then those mixed partials are going to be equal to each other. And so having one positive and one negative but being equal to each other, it's going to make zero. So the divergence of the curl of a vector field is zero. Uh, in vector notation, well, that should make sense. We shouldn't have had to do so much work if we just think about vectors. I know that the cross product of two vectors is perpendicular to each one of those vectors. So A cross B is perpendicular to A. A cross B is perpendicular to B. And so if I take a and I dot it with a cross b, I should get zero. I have to get zero. a is orthogonal to the cross product, a cross b. So it makes sense that del would be orthogonal to del cross f. So del dotted with del cross f should equal zero. Uh, by the way, uh, if you have a vector field, any vector field, doesn't have to be come from the curl, uh, but its divergence is zero, then we call that vector field divergence-free, or the other word is solenoidal. So maybe we can explain that solenoidal in a future video. Uh, so the divergence of the curl is zero. That should also make sense if we think back the definition of curl. So remember that, that the curl is uh, a vector which is parallel to the axis of rotation. Right? So if I have a small circle uh, around my uh, around a point in the vector field, well the curl is, is uh, going to be pointing out of the plane. So uh, none of it is crossing over that circle. So it makes sense that the divergence of the curl is going to be zero. All right, let's look at a couple of examples uh, to end up the video. We're going to try to find the divergence of this uh, vector field. So remember, you just take the partial with respect to x of the first component, add it to the partial with respect to y of the second component, add that to the partial with respect to z of the third component. So let's go ahead and take those partial derivatives. I'll get 2xy. There's no y in the second component, so it's partial with respect to y is 0. And then the last partial with respect to z of the third component is y squared. So you just get 2xy plus y squared. 
much easier to remember than the curl, much easier to compute than the curl. All right, so in our second example, we're given a vector field G, and we'd like to show that this could not possibly be the curl of any other vector field. In other words, there should be no vector field F such that G is the curl of F. Well, let's think about this. If there is such an F where the curl of F equals G, then if I take the divergence of both sides, then the divergence of the curl of F must be the divergence of G. Well, we just found out that the divergence of the curl is always zero. But if I take the divergence of this vector field, well, the partial of the first component with respect to x is 2z squared. The partial of the second component with respect to y is 2xz. And the partial of the third component with respect to z is 2x squared. So if I add those up, I am not going to get 0. So one side is 0, one the other side is not 0. That's what we call a contradiction. And so there's no way that any f can exist. And just to side, uh, if you can find a vector field f, such the curl of f is g, then that vector field f is called a vector potential of g. So I refer to that back when we learned about scalar potentials. Remember those scalar functions f where the gradient of uh, lowercase f equals our vector field. Here we're saying that if you have a vector field whose curl is the given vector field, the vector field that you take the curl of is the vector or is a vector potential of g. It's actually really hard to directly calculate the, a, a vector potential if it exists. And that ends our video on divergence.